Christ is still the King. Welcome yeah. to the Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr on Iowa Catholic Radio. Every Wednesday, diving deep in the truth of the Catholic Church and restoring all things in Christ. The Uncommon Good, live from the Mercy Live Up Studio. The Uncommon Good is on the air. I'm Bo Bonner. And Bud Marr. We are coming to you from the Iowa Catholic Radio Network, 1150 AM, 88.5 FM, 94.5 FM, streaming live on iowacatholicradio.com. And if you have the Iowa Catholic Radio app, you can hear it wherever you are, thanks to Blessman Ministries and the People's Abstract Company. Uh, We're here in the Mercy Live Up studio in beautiful Des Moines, Iowa. If you really want to, we even have a webcam where you can see what you will see. Like a sailor who came to see what he could see and then told no one. But we're here if you want to see it. Bud, how are you doing? I'm doing okay. I just noticed that when I offer my greeting on each show, I kind of sound like Ron Burgundy, like I'm asking a question. I'm Bud Marr. <laughs> you're, you're unsure about it. I don't know how to say that, just like that phrase, and make it very forceful. Like, I'm Bud Marr. I think, you know, if you listen to John Leonetti, you have to have your voice. John Leonetti <laughs> has it with a, a quick clip. You could be like, I'm Bud Mar, and then be, yeah, no, don't do that. <laughs> so, Bud, uh, it's that time of year again where all of our children are developing the plague and passing it on. I heard your yeah. household is a household people should stay thirty feet away from. Well, we're almost out of the clear, but when you have seven under one roof and we don't live in a mansion, things get passed along pretty easily. But I think we're almost out of the woods. So yeah, I, our whole family's been like that too. It, I think I've had this cold since like 1972 and I was born in 1981 so that's the sort of cold that's been going around people well like I said here in Mercy uh, uh, Live Up Studio but as always we're underwritten (coughs) by Mercy College of Health Sciences where uh, Bud and I work we have our uh, new year uh, starting out we've uh, seen the kids pretty much a second time now so they all love us you know it always goes that way right Bud (laughs) sure Um, what we have coming up that we want to invite all of you to is the Faith and Healing Speaker Series that we have uh, speakers four times a year come on campus and talk about the intersection of faith and the healing sciences. Um, February 9th at 6 p.m., we have Sister Patricia Talone coming to talk about, um, she's a Sister of Mercy, and maybe talk about the foundations of healthcare and how that relates uh, to uh, the Catholic world. So, Bud, what do you, the other thing, right, is there's food, even if people don't want to hear the topic, right? Yeah, have you settled on... Um, our culinary selection this time. No, maybe we should like open up a like a, 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 a some sort of thing on the internet that people can choose. But I'm afraid it will be ribs or something. Well, you brought this up with students, and I think you mentioned soup. And the students were like, "Well, you have to provide grilled cheese as well." Yeah, like, well, I don't know if I can do both, but they were. Like, yeah, I don't know if that's an Iowa thing that like you can't have soup without just grilled soup cheese. on its own. Yeah, it's not so. a meal. Um, also brought to you, uh, underwritten by Cartridge World. I think last week we said that we might have Joe in, um, but we're not doing that this week. Yeah, Joe from Cartridge World. We're hoping that he can come on the show next week. We've had a conversation with him both about his faith, but also um, leading Cartridge World. So that should be a good conversation. And like we've always pointed out with him, the old days of Big 8 basketball. <laughs> uh, Cartridge World uh, for toner uh Cartridges and everything that you might need when it comes to your printing needs. 801 73rd Street in Windsor Heights, 515 564 7400. Like I said, hopefully we get to have him on next week. Today, we have, I think, our first repeating yeah. guest. So, this is a pretty big bellwether for us. Dr. Matthew Umbarger, assistant professor at Newman University, my good friend for a long time and brilliant Old Testament scholar, bud. Yeah, Matthew will be our first recurring guest, so he's officially. A friend of the show. We had a great conversation with them last time. But uh, this week, we hope with the presidential inauguration coming right up, um, a lot of Catholics, I think, have politics and social life on their mind. But we want to talk about a biblical vision of these things. I don't want to prejudge the conversation too much, so maybe let Matthew, <coughs> excuse me, take it where he will. Yeah. Uh, as always, Matthew is an uh, Old Testament pro. And we'll get that perspective from him when we get back. So stick with us, friends. We will be back in the Mercy Live Up studio in a minute. St- Thank you to Mercy College of Health Sciences downtown Des Moines for underwriting the uncommon good with me, Bo Bonner. And I'm Dr. Bud Marr. We're heard every Wednesday at 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. on the Iowa Catholic Radio Network. A fun and engaging new show that we hope our listeners will love. Be sure to listen. Hey, friends, John Leonetti here, inviting all men of Iowa to attend the Faith for the Journey Catholic Men's Conference, Saturday, March 25th at St. Francis of Assisi Catholic Church in West Des Moines. Register today online at iowacatholicradio.com. 
Thank you, Confluence Brewing Company, for underwriting Faith on Trial with Defender of the Faith, Deacon Mike Mano. Confluence Brewing Company, brewed locally and featuring regular, seasonal, and limited release beers. Available at local stores, bars, and restaurants. We are back with the Uncommon Good, Bo Bonner and Bud Marr, and on our show today is our first sure reoccurring guest, our first friend of the show, Dr. Matthew Umbarger, assistant professor at Newman University in Wichita, Kansas, Old Testament whiz. Matthew, how are you doing today? Wonderful, Bo, and uh, greetings to you, Bud. Thank uh, you, Matthew. Blessed be the name of the glory of the kingdom forever and ever. Well, the, the when we have special guests like you, uh, Matthew, it already seems like the glorious kingdom is upon <laughs> us, at least in small ways. So thank you again. Like I said, pretty special distinction, dude. You are the first reoccurring guest. How does that make you feel? Oh, my. Yeah, I, I, you better give me a certificate. <laughs> we do not have enough. Oh, we can do that with Cartridge World, bud. Yeah, no, see, see we're professionals here, Matthew. <laughs> here at the Mercy Live Up studio, underwritten. Okay, anyway. Um, Matthew, so today, uh, well, this week, we have the presidential inauguration coming up after maybe one of the more contentious political mm-hmm. years in recent memory. And I don't even mean the Cubs World Series. I mean, you know, just actual straight <laughs> politics. Um, so certainly people feel many different ways about the, yeah. the presidential election that's coming up. But like always, Bud and I want to sort of dig deeper and maybe ask more fundamental questions before we get um, to do you like a president or not or how does this make yeah. you feel. And we thought you were a perfect person to come on to talk about this because the Old Testament, as much as it talks about kings and rulers and obedience and all these things, it really seems to have... I would think it's fair to say an ambivalent or at least two messages that it holds in tension when it comes yeah. to rulers and the people of God. Well, I think it has more than two. <laughs> I think it has all kinds of mixed messages. Um, first of all, I want to say I feel like this is a little bit of a trap. Because <laughs> if you want, if you want to uh, either, if you want to make people upset, you you talk about religion or politics, and here you have me talking about both. So. Um, people are going to hate me, but I'm going to try to just keep it like all Old Testament so that my uh, opinions about the current political affairs don't come out too much. Um, yeah, the, the Old Testament um, is, it's it's really interesting that you, you don't have a consistent ideology. I'll put it that way. You don't have a consistent nationalistic ideology in the Old Testament. You have a lot of different opinions. Um, and when you consider all of the opportunities that the editors of this collection of books had, and not just um, assembling the canon, but actually editing the books themselves, they, they had a lot, of, a lot of opportunities to make this a homogenous body of material, and they didn't. They, they include a lot of things that, on the face of them, are at odds with one another. And um, sometimes people look at this and they, they see this as evidence that this is a completely man-made book. They see this as contradiction. I see this as actually testimony to the inspiration of Scripture, because we have other collections of nationalistic um, hymns, prophecies uh, from the ancient world, and they do not have these contradictory voices in them. They're all very consistent. They march in lockstep with one another. And uh, and especially all of the criticism that is laid against the royal family in the Old Testament. Um, so on the one hand, you have a very clear messianic theology that the line of David is chosen, uh, that God promises that an heir of David's throne will sit on that throne Till the end of time, and yet um, the the Old Testament pulls no punches when describing the failures of his dynasty, and um, and so it, it's a really uh, complex and marvelous work. Thanks, Matthew. Getting into that last point that you were making, um, one tension that I've wrestled with in in the biblical witness has to do with that idea. So Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of so much that's talked about in the Old Testament. And one of those pieces is that he's the Davidic king, right? 
and, and there's all these there's all these psalms that praise even David himself. Yet when the people of Israel first ask for a king, the prophet Samuel's not too thrilled, and he gives the people all these warnings like the, right. the, the king will conscript your sons, will um, you know he'll heavily tax you, and on and on and on. I mean, what was what was the issue when the when the people first asked for a king? It can't be kingship per se, right? Well, <laughs> again, it's it's, it's it's complex. It's it's you can't get a uh, straightforward ideology out of these pages. So you're referring to First Samuel eight, uh, where Samuel. I mean, he it's it's much more than just warning what the king is going to do. He God tells Samuel himself that um, by asking you to put a king over them, they have rejected me from being king over them. And I think that's the key, is God will entertain no, um, no one who's trying to claim authority that belongs to him alone. And there's always a temptation for kings to try and overstep their bounds. So on the one hand... You have this statement in 1 Samuel 8, which says that Israel is rejecting God as their king. On the other hand, if you go back a few pages to the Book of Judges, um, the conclusion of the Book of Judges has probably the most depressing um, (laughs) collection of chapters in the Bible. Um, The appendix to the Book of Judges, beginning around chapter 17, is um, very, very dark uh, and very violent and, and even sordid. And there's a recurring theme that shows up in those pages, and, and it acts as a bookmark. Um, in chapter 17 of Judges, verse 6, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. And the same statement is the last verse of the whole book. And when you read the book of Judges, you feel uh, the, the point of the book of Judges is obviously this is a mess. These people need a king because they're doing all of these terrible things to each other. And I would say that that is, um, we have to remember Judges and the books of Samuel are all, all part of a single historical narrative that we call the Deuteronomistic history. And they all have more or less the same kind of agenda they're trying to explain how the Davidic line comes to power and, and how and the promises, the covenant promises God makes to David. But even so, right there before before we get to the David stuff, we have Samuel um, tempering that with this warning that you can't have it both ways, ultimately. Either God's going to be your king, or you're going to have a a man who's ultimately going to fail and going to try to claim authority that doesn't belong to him. This is and the so un- it, it cre- oh, go, creates sorry, a dilemma. Ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. So. No, this is the uncommon good with uh, Bo and Bud Marr here in Mercy Live Up Studio. Matthew, sorry for interrupting you. Oh, no problem. That, that reminds me that um, one of the things that when people approach scriptures, they sometimes have, uh, I think, trouble um, getting in their mind is any time you sort of parachute into scripture, you mm-hmm. can really make something seem uh, crystal clear or univocal or like you were saying – have one message, and this is why we always are worried when people, we say, you know, that people um, proof text, right? Like, there's one way in which the Bible is a tapestry, and, like, every part of it has something to say to our lives. But if you start only reading certain passages, you can come up with some really brilliant, absolutely wrong understandings of what the <laughs> Scripture is trying to say. Yeah. And I think that this is, like you said, I love that compelling argument that if the Bible wasn't what it said it was, it would be too... Um, uh, scared to let its warts show, but because yeah. it's confident that it's the Word of God, it has no Amen. problem um, demonstrating that the very thing God has enacted has these difficulties sort of wrapped up in it. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, th- of course, for Christians, what we say is there is a, there is a way to solve this dilemma. Jesus Christ is God and man, and That's so right. he can be king. But you don't want to, so to speak... Uh, purchase that point too soon because if we don't sit with the dilemma through the old testament like i always like to tell people the old testament is massive compared to the size of the new testament so god's clearly telling us something that he wants us to stew about this difficulty Mm -hmm. 
And only then will we appreciate what Jesus Christ's coming as the God-man and the Messiah truly uh, gives us. Amen. Yeah. Um, I subscribed to canon criticism, uh, which was put together by a guy named Reverend Childs in the 70s. And, um, and the idea of canon criticism is that the best way to read the Bible is not to do archaeology and try to find all the sources, but actually kind of looking at everything retrospectively and and meditating, really, on why is it that this got in here? Why did the community of God choose this story, this prophecy, and recognize this as sacred writ, and put it alongside things that it doesn't, on the surface, harmonize with? And um, I think we can see that God is patient. We're not. God's patient. And so he's kind of building the argument, and he's laying things in place, and um, and taking, allowing Israel, kind of go down to go down these dead end roads, and at the same time using those roads as kind of models for how he's going to ultimately uh, play out our salvation. Um, the Psalms is a great example. I um, a lot of the Psalms that we think of as being messianic as applying to Jesus, and, and they do. That was the Holy Spirit's intent, no doubt. But uh, when they were written, Psalm 2, Psalm 72, Psalm 110, all of these really, really nationalistic, tinged hymns, um, they, they would be unbearing, uh, unbearingly um, nationalistic in their tone if it weren't for our recognition that these are true in a way that the author didn't even recognize. So when it talks about in Psalms 2, the the son, the adopted son of God, sitting on the throne of David and smashing the, the nations like potsherds, for instance, um, we understand that this is fulfilled in Jesus in a way that the author couldn't possibly have really understood. And yet, the Holy Spirit brings that in, puts it alongside... Um, um, I remember one time I was really, really depressed about politics, though we were having a discussion, and you quoted to me Psalm 146, 3, put not your trust in princes. Right. And um, I'll never forget that conversation. Um, And uh, I meditated. I've been meditating on that ever since, really, uh, for a couple years now. So in the same collection of works where we have um, it's Psalm 72, which which basically says that the the Sion of David is kind of a demigod. In that same collection, we're told, "Don't put your trust in him." <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and and I think that's really significant uh, that we we get this kind of both and and, and it and it. And the other thing we have to remember is basically the entire Old Testament is put together after the experiment of the Davidic line has apparently come to fail. Um, that Deuteronomistic history I was talking about ends in Second Kings, with Zedekiah seeing his, king, his uh, sons, who were to inherit the throne, he sees them slaughtered before his eyes, and his eyes are gouged out. So that's the last thing burned in his memory. And it looks as though God has maybe broken his covenant with David, and yet the people who put this collection together had a heroic faith that God would somehow keep his promises in a way that they could not ascertain, in a way that would be um, ultimately much better than just putting your faith in some human prince who's going to let you down eventually. Yeah, the Old Testament pulls no punches. So, uh, Matthew, we, uh, we see this tension in the Old Testament, and as Christians we might think that after Jesus, that's just all resolved. But it's yeah. not that simple, right? So in the book of no. Revelation... The emperor who rules Babylon, the city of man, is aligned with demonic forces, and he's drunk on the blood of the saints. And St. Paul himself lived in this reality. I mean, the empire eventually killed him. Mm -hmm. And yet Paul admonishes his readers to offer prayers for all authorities. He says, let everyone be subject to governing authorities because those that exist have been instituted by God. So even, I know at the beginning you said you're reticent to jump too far into our own times, but as... (laughs) As followers of Jesus, when we start thinking yeah. about living in this tension, I mean, the entire biblical vision, it's not one of 
quietism, but it's also not yep. violent revolution. I mean, the scriptures give us something much more difficult, but promising to live out. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, like, St. Paul calls the Roman Empire and the, the uh, officials in the Roman Empire ministers of God's righteousness, for crying out loud. Um, <laughs> he calls the people who are going to eventually behead him uh, ministers of righteousness. So that tells you that he's subscribing to a much more complicated political theory than anything we get close to in our modern discourse. Um, I think, again, it goes back to that recognition that without some ruling authority, we have the Book of Judges, yep. and we can't have that. Um, Oklahoma was, before 1917. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. And so, so we, need, um, we need somebody, even, even when our authorities um, do things that are unjust, like conscript our sons and daughters, um, we, we still need them. Otherwise, we're going to do it, everything that comes up in our own heart. And because um, here's the, the truth, unless God is ruling in our heart, um, we are going to be king. So it's even better to have someone else be king than for, our, for a, every person to be a king. Um, that, that would be intolerable. And, and so you have that recognition in the New Testament as well, but at the same time, as you said, bud, um, make no bones about it, that there are basically two kingdoms in the New Testament. You have the kingdom of God, which has come in the person of Jesus Christ, and every other kingdom is going to rub up against him and, and have problems with his authority. And, and so, ultimately, all worldly political systems are manifestations of that beast that we see in the book of Revelation. Well, and also, this is a side point. I said 1917. I meant 1907. I know when Oklahoma became a state. <laughs> the point still stands, though. It was pretty rough those first 10 years. Yeah. No, I think, I think Matthew, that that's a great way to quote on it. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. But um, this idea that when we think about how the political structure and how the civic world comes together, that if we really believe Jesus Christ is who he says he is, that just like God can use death itself for some yeah. good, that he can use governments no matter how backwards or good they are. Now, again, that doesn't mean that we have to uh, subscribe all governments to the dustbin of history as evil and vile, but it's it's this strange thing that we're always called to as the church, which is to be you know in the world but not of it, and to sort of use the things of the world but without um, attaching, letting our hearts grow flesh over them, as it were, to not yeah. like subsume them into ourselves. So we we will, if we can use the political system to do good, uh, to work for the kingdom of God, by all means, brothers and sisters, do it. But if that's taken yeah. from us, it's no skin off of our back, because whatever yeah. it is that God allows in front of us to be used for his kingdom is worth it. But anything that would drag us away, even a perceived good, um, we can't let that uh, take us off the path towards heaven. So, uh, Matthew, it's been wonderful to talk to you. You've been very illuminating. Matthew Umbarger, the assistant professor at Newman University, uh, our first reoccurring guest. Matthew, that means someday soon we're going to have you back. Thank you very much. All it's right, God bless. Honor. Yeah, and uh, so here. everybody stick around in a minute. We have uh, a great moments in church history for you, so don't change that channel. Thank you to Mercy College of Health Sciences downtown Des Moines for underwriting the uncommon good with me, Bo Bonner. And I'm Dr. Bud Marr. We're heard every Wednesday at 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. on the Iowa Catholic Radio Network. A fun and engaging new show that we hope our listeners will love. Be sure to listen. Iowa Catholic Radio would like to say a special thank you to our business partners that underwrite our programming. Friends, each day God's word is proclaimed on this station. The message of Jesus Christ and the teachings of the church can be heard and are changing lives. We are very grateful for our business partners and would like to bless them for their support. That is why we've created an online business directory. Organized by topic for easy use, we hope you'll like it. Go to iowacatholicradio.com to check it out. Join us, Joe Stopulis and Father Zach Kautsky, for Man Up, airing every Monday at 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. as we discuss issues to help men of faith. Thank you to John Harada with Farm Bureau and Adele for underwriting Man Up. Farm Bureau agent John Harada. Insurance can be simple. 515-559-4266.
And now, great moments in church history. The year 360. The place, Alexandria. One great saint, St. Athanasius, was about to give the world the life of another great saint, St. Anthony of Egypt. And Christianity would never be the same. Hermits from the east and the west are beginning to make their voice heard in the world, Jim, even as they pledge to live in the desert away from it. Early in his life, St. Anthony heard the call of Jesus to the rich young man, sell all your things and follow me, and literally took it, literally. Kit, I've never seen anyone give away their possessions so fast. And now Anthony is sprinting down the boundary straight into the desert to live a life of radical poverty. One might think that Anthony was giving up a life of trouble for solitude and quiet. But his new practice facility should have been a clue to everyone involved, as the hermit took up the hermitage in an abandoned fortress, ready to do battle. Demons are all around St. Anthony. They're tempting him with lust and despair. They're physically attacking him, Jim. They're lacerating his skin. The devil even beat him so bad that he went unconscious, definitely earning him a trip to concussion protocol. The devil wants to see him on the sidelines. After telling the demons off for the last time, Anthony emerged from his solitude, not withered and decrepit from fasting, as the villagers and the surrounding areas thought, but as a healthy person, not only in body, but especially in spirit. Anthony's story is inspiring those around him. People are flocking to the desert in droves to learn from this simple hermit. Without even meaning to, Anthony has become an abbot and has laid the foundation of every monastic order that has come after him. An empire who created the church at the beginning of his life is now flooded with people embracing the ascetical life. Do you believe in miracles? Yes! His life, as fantastic in reality as any account could recall, St. Athanasius wrote The Life of St. Anthony, which became a runaway all-star of Christian literature for the rest of history, inspiring scores of people to follow Christ wherever they might lead. This has been another great moment in church history. Bo, I know we're running up against the clock, but sometimes I just want to say real quick, it's interesting to me when I listen to the great moments, how they can coalesce with the show. Yeah. So I think at this time period, you know, when Christians, like there was a lot of political chaos going on and it would have been easy for someone like St. Athanasius or St. Anthony just to be kind of, oh, you know, to to get depressed or, or turn away from the world. And yet St. Anthony making this radical commitment that helped to preserve culture and laid the foundation for what we call the West today. I mean, Western Christendom. Amen. But I don't think there's a better way to wrap that up. So St. Anthony, pray for us. Thank you, Matthew Umbarger, uh, for being part of our show and really having a great conversation. Um, we will see you guys uh, next week on Wednesday. Make sure to listen to Read the Bible in a Year, 5 a.m. Um, every morning. And may the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, reign in our hearts, in our families, in our cities, in our communities, in the entire world. Uh, thanks for listening, guys. And may God give you every blessing. We will see you next week. The Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr is heard Wednesdays at 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. on Iowa Catholic Radio and on the official Iowa Catholic Radio app. 